going to press the live and LinkedIn button. Ta-da! We're getting the hang of this now. Okay, welcome to Q2 Conversations. These are the highlight of my week and they're getting better and better. Today we have a special guest. Jacqueline from Pursuit of Wisdom will be telling us a little bit about the work that she's going to be bringing into Qualified Tutor as a supervision circle. So if you don't know what supervision is yet, hang on to your hats because I think you're going to see really quickly why it's helpful for tutors to have supervision. So Without any further fuss, Jacqueline, would you mind unmuting and telling us a little bit about that? And then what we'll do is we'll use that as a jumping off point for a broader conversation. Let's go. Lovely. Thank you so much, Julia. And good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be with you today. So um, you may not have heard of supervision because as an educator myself, it was something that I hadn't heard of until I came into the kind of coaching realm, the coaching field. And it's like a kind of best practice to have it. But my business partner, Lorna, who's also my twin sister, has a background in health. So she's a children's occupational therapist. And with this health background um, and the caring profession, supervision is actually like a core element. And it's actually like a requirement for passing their degree. So even as students, they were given supervision. And it's an ongoing requirement as part of her career path. So regardless of seniority or experience you would still be part of a supervision um, circle maybe every one week to two weeks and it's just a really safe space non-judgmental space for those people who are in a profession where they are caring for others just as as teachers and tutors are so you can come you can reflect on what you've been doing well and learn from it. So it's also about sharing those little wins rather than just always focusing on something that's maybe negative or a challenge. It's looking at the big picture. And you can also bring things that you think you might like to improve on, that reflective space to do so. It also helps you keep your practice safe. So like to make sure that you're ensuring that you're respecting health boundaries, you're respecting yourself. If something's come up in a session where you've maybe felt a little bit triggered or unsure about something, it gives you that space to kind of like download in a non-judgmental way. And it can also help you plan for developmental needs that you might have in your future where you can maybe see like a gap or you think, oh, actually I need some more support around that. And it lets you think about how that would look. So with um, QT, we are planning and offering pilot supervision circles to the QT community um, using a group model of supervision. And we don't have the time to do the full thing, but we are going to be doing that on the, is it the 23rd of November? We're going to be offering a full supervision circle for you to try out. But the first part of supervision or a key part of it is reflection. So reflection is like the, that process of analyzing questioning reframing an experience in order to make an assessment of it for the purposes of learning so either like reflective learning we'd call that or reflective practice so we would always have an element of reflective practice in a supervision circle and I want to just give you a little experience of that just now so if you could grab a pen and a bit of paper you're just gonna this is gonna be a writing exercise yep it doesn't have to be a pretty bit of paper it just needs to be a bit of paper to get your thoughts out so this is what a reflective practice would look like and feel like so in a moment I'm going to give you a chance to think about a recent session that you had working with a child that you felt went very well okay so in a moment not now but in a moment I'm going to be asking you some little prompt questions to get you thinking. So bringing to mind this experience with working with a child that was successful, think about how you prepared. Was there anything to note in the environment when you're remembering this, this time? Had you used familiar resources? What was your energy like before and during the session? Were your goals very clear? 
and what are the criteria for a successful session. So that's the prompts we're going to be working through. So I could just ask you to bring to mind a session that you had with a pupil that you felt went very well. We're just going to take about three minutes to really focus in on this session. And we're just going to, I just want you to use your pen and paper. It's just a kind of um, reflective uh, writing session. So it's just anything that comes to mind as I ask you these questions, anything that comes to your mind, just note them down. And we're going to think about the elements that you feel help the session to be successful. So I'm going to ask you to think about, first of all, how did you prepare for this session? So Elizabeth, that first question was, how did you prepare for this successful session? Was there anything of note in the environment? Take yourself back. What was the environment like that helped this be a successful session? Had you used familiar resources? What was your energy like before and during the session? Were your goals very clear? What is your criteria for a successful session? How would you know? And then if we can just take a moment to reflect on that overall experience for you, how did you feel? How did you feel? So now we're going to extract the learning from this successful experience. What learning can you take from it? What learning can you take from it?
Okay, well done. So we're now going to forward pace this learning into a future session. Can you all think of a session that you have coming up, perhaps a child you find more challenging to have success with? What learning from this successful session can you take forward to improve your chances of having more success and enjoying this next future session? What learning can you take forward? to ensure success in this future session. I'm seeing the writing coming to an end. Well done. So then the next part of this is accountability. So having the courage to share and hold yourself accountable, take forward this action, is the thing that's going to springboard your overall success. So I'm going to ask for some courage. If anyone would like to share what they have learnt, realised, reflected upon, and what they might do next as their next steps. Would anyone like to share? Um, um, <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I'm in a situation just recently with somebody who joined me online, and I'd had a similar situation the week before with another parent another child and it was the environment of the um the background that was quite noisy and it was causing a distraction so i'd spoken to one parent at the end of the lesson and just kind of explained what had happened and i didn't feel it gone particularly well um so i had to kind of think about how i could word it differently or explain it differently to kind of help because i had the same situation happen again and because the second time it happened it was after i was doing an assessment to kind of understand if this child was going to be suitable well, at that point i just thought i can't i can't take this child on if this is the environment that they are they've got going on in the background i'm now actually going to have this conversation not two lessons into the process but i'm gonna have it straight away um so so yeah i did and i kind of said to the parent look this is actually really detrimental to your child's ability to hear what i'm saying focus on what's going on follow the lesson and actually benefit from any of this and so i'd actually said to the parent i don't think this is the right thing for you to do um at which point they kind of you know thought about it and just went well we can just move him it's not a it's not a problem we'll move him to a different space we'll make sure it's quiet that's what happened and the difference it made was huge because he was able to participate in the lesson. He asked so many questions in that lesson. Um, he, you know, he wasn't afraid of like coming forward when he didn't understand things um, because there was already that kind of expectation that if you don't understand, that's it. That's the environment of the 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 the, um, the session that we have. But had he been in that same environment, he just wouldn't have been able to connect with anything that was going on. And so the gaps just grow, don't they? So, so it's kind of just thinking, well. I've got to step up and say something sooner as opposed to kind of thinking somebody's going to do something about this. This is, you know, 
no, I think it's on me to sort of say something. That's, that's a brilliant reflection. And, and I think it's just being courageous enough to, to do so, to actually know that you, you do know what, what's best. <laughs> and actually just coming in quickly and saying, do you know what, we can't hear each other here. This yeah. is going to be really challenging and it's going to be another barrier to, to you learning. Um, well done. Excellent. Thank you. Well done. Would anyone else like to share? Um, I was considering two sisters. One of them, um, really good session, went fantastically well. I've only worked with them two weeks. And the mum has already, if you like, warned me, if that's the right word, that the one where the session went really well, really enthusiastic, wants to learn and all of that sort of thing. The other one, year nine. Um, so the first one is year seven. This one's year nine. The mum has said she's lazy and she's not interested in maths. So try your best to see what happens. So I think I've written down there about... Um, not being judgmental and carrying the enthusiasm from the younger one to the older one, but not comparing them and not sort of saying your sister's better than you type of thing. I mean, I wouldn't say it like that anyway, but being very aware that they are very different individuals and not everybody does like maths, but they've still got to do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's what I'd written down. That's a great reflection, Claire. And I love the way you said that non-judgmental part because she's already come to you with a label. <laughs> and, she, you know, whether mum's saying that as a kind of, oh, just to warn you, you know, but you have the power and the energy to show up for that child in a way that says, like, I completely believe in you. I'm here for you. And whatever you kind of, like, put in, then I will help amplify that for you. And she's not her sister. And she's maybe had years of being, you know, told, oh, if only you could do it like, you know. <laughs> and I think also that kind of, when you get to a certain age as well, explaining how you're feeling, they do sort of tend to say less words. <laughs> um, so it might look as if she's being lazy, as in she's maybe not producing the same thing, but you don't know what's going on inside her mind and what she's thinking. So I think that's really a super reflection that um, if you could just be that non-judgmental kind of line in the sand, whatever happens from here on in, it's your progress and I'm here to champion you. It, it's the thought that two students that come to me independently from totally different families, different parts of the country, I wouldn't compare them with each other wouldn't. Um, because they have different teachers, different experiences, that sort of thing. So for sisters, it's exactly the same and bearing that in mind. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Thank you. Great reflection. So Jacqueline, I feel like that was a lovely little um, introduction to what it feels like to share. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing that in the chat. Um, a lovely opportunity for us to think about reflective practice. And that's sort of what I wanted to discuss as a group today. Um, and the way that we run these QT conversations is that there really isn't an agenda. I just pick up threads and we just follow from tangent to tangent. And it, it gets quite interesting. So um, I would love to know about... Um, Let's start with with reflective practice and what your thoughts are on the challenges of reflective practice as a tutor um, and then the benefits of them. What, what is reflect? Let's start differently. What does reflective practice mean to you? I think it's accepting when things haven't quite gone the right way that you were, you're anticipating and understanding and accepting that you're not you're not going to do it perfectly all the time. And being okay with that. And so you've got to be in the right headspace to accept that, haven't you? Sometimes you just, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, it's it's easy to kind of think, well, you know, they weren't in the right headspace, they weren't ready to engage, they weren't ready to listen. And actually, sometimes when you, you take a step back from the emotion of that, um, there are things that you can do, there are things that you can just, just probably always something that you can do differently but it's being in it's it's being in that space in the first place isn't it um 
I remember when, when I first spoke to the first parent about the situation and it was almost as though he got really offended that I kind of raised it with him. And I knew that was not going anywhere. I knew after that I was never going to see him again. And that's exactly what happened. And then I had to take again, I had to take a step back from that and just think, well, that's that's got to be okay because it's not just that one person in that home environment that I've got to consider. I've got to consider the impact of that on all the other students in that session and who are also paying for that session, whose parents are also paying for that session, who are also witnessing what's going on. So we've got to keep the standards there, haven't we? And the expectations have got to be, it's it's me that's got to set those those expectations, whatever the cost. Um, so and that, that's, that's a bit tricky sometimes. But it's also really trustful behaviour on your part, mm-hmm. right? Because you're taking responsibility for the needs of all the students in the room. Yeah. But also for that student, because, you know, in the second scenario where they moved the child to a different room, what was so lovely about that was it wasn't difficult for them to change it once you'd shown them what the child needed. Yeah. And so for you to step up and be that trusted adult and say, this is what your student needs to be, your child needs to be successful, is absolutely who you are for that child and for that family. Um, but I, I had a, uh, I had a quite a visceral response when you said you've got to be in the right headspace for reflective practice, because when I'm feeling insecure, I don't feel reflective. I just beat myself up. Yeah, that wasn't good enough. Why did I think I could do that? Of course, I wasn't going to be able to do that well. That was, you know. You know, and and the negative self talk can really escalate where you you allow yourself to believe it was a failure rather than an opportunity for learning, yeah. And then the flip side of that, and you said you've got to be in the right headspace for it. Of okay, didn't nail it, but the challenge now is how do I respond to the fact that I didn't nail it? And I I I have definitely felt really extreme versions of both of those things yeah I can. Well, yeah so I also think like children are very um uh, kind <laughs> so what I've learned is when you say say you didn't have a good session when you come back and say do you know what I don't think last week went as well as it could have done and I've been thinking about how we could maybe make this better and it's like you work together to the solution and children are really open to that they're very generous <laughs> um, but I think when you're t- talking about that um that negative critical voice Julia I don't know if that's well I think having had the experience of no supervision in teaching and that feeling very lonely it was like the burden of everything that happened in that classroom environment was on your shoulders the thought of going to somebody in um a senior management role it, you only ever brought like things that were significant <laughs> you know so saying to to senior management okay I don't know if my lesson on fractions went as well as I as I was hoping it would today it, it sounds trivial and you just wouldn't do it so well also it escalates it too far. Yes. I'm so sorry I interrupted you but it actually it makes it sound like you're a rubbish teacher of fractions yes. rather than you're an ambitious like, teacher of fractions well I better get in there and start observing you yes let me all your yeah. lessons rubbish and you're like Oh, so you learn early on that you just keep things to yourself because any vulnerability, and that is the key thing here, the only way anyone's going to grow is to be vulnerable. But you can't be vulnerable in an environment that attacks you for being vulnerable. And I think we've had all had that experience. And I, I'm curious if I would love to see if supervision circles were brought into the educational field would we have less teachers burning out would we have less teachers leaving the profession would we have because when something goes wrong the instinct is to you know cover it up not tell anyone that was a rubbish lesson oh my goodness they didn't get that oh um you know rather than going why did that just not happen as well you know in my head it was going to be this amazing lesson why did that go wrong and actually thinking yeah it could have been environmental how did I turn up was I like really low energy um you know was was the child the children just not feeling it that day should I just have read the room (laughs) 
yeah like, read the energy like this is not landing with any of you I need to change it up and be okay with that but because you've written the lesson plan you know <gasps> dare I trust my own instincts and go off it so that's the thing I feel like with with supervision it gives you that safe space to be vulnerable and actually you know in your own if you gave this yourself the spaciousness you would know why but you yeah. have to have the spaciousness to like work through that to go oh yeah that's what would make that better but if you don't have that it just sort of stops dead and that's where this negativity I think and this critical voice comes in um I I really resonate with your um, point about children can be kind as well. In school, my experience is that children aren't kind. <laughs> um, but the, there is that front that the teacher is always right. But in tutoring, um, I've said previously how I'm creating all my own resources. Um, children can access them when they're not with me. There's things like activities, multiple choice questions and all sorts of things. And I've been saying to the kids, if you notice a mistake in it, let me know. I'll change it. And I have now kids. I, I, I have my to do list and every topic I can go in and I can write a note to myself to get it changed. And I have kids now that will log on. And then when they come to me, they'll say this true or false thing you did. I clicked false. But it said that the answer was true. Can you check it? And it's almost part of the learning process. And they're picking up my mistakes. I hope there's not too many, but obviously I'm only human. And I'm. it's a simple thing where I forget to put the checkbox when I'm setting the question up. Um, but you're right, they are, they are kind. And some of them are now coming back to me and saying, can we check this question? Sometimes it turns out that it's a question that they've misunderstood. Sometimes it's my error and it's it's become a great thing, actually. It's all learning. Whereas as I a teacher, that. I couldn't imagine that happening. No, no, you. I think it's how we also set it up. So because you've managed to create your own um, ethos, Claire, <laughs> if you like, you've created your own ecosystem ethos, like this is how we relate to each other. A mistake is seen as a chance to both learn. As you say, it could be your error, like you didn't, check something or it could actually be oh we did I understand why you thought of it that way but this is what I was meaning so maybe the instruction wasn't clear perhaps the way I've explained it but you both learned together like, how could we make this better so that wouldn't happen again and then they're invested so yet yeah, children are kind because no one likes having the, their mistakes pointed out <laughs> but it's the way you react rather than taking offense at it as you say like oh the teacher's always right no they're not they're just humans <laughs> who are you know that there's that kind of fear, isn't there? Like, oh, I'm going to be found out, which is a, an unhelpful environment to learn in. And if we have that for our children, if our children feel that, how likely are they to say, I'm not understanding something or I've made a mistake here, but I don't really understand why. So I think that's really lovely that you've got that kind of co-creation with your children that you're working with. Well done. This is such a glorious conversation and it's bringing so much up for me and I, I'm reading the room and I'm feeling like everybody's finding it a very, very positive experience. And for me, it's very much about, you know, taking responsibility and how positive it feels to realise how much we can change and how, how much we can influence how things go when we're in the right headspace. And Claire's example there of really co-creating the resource with your students and having that you know trustful conversation that risk-free conversation of is the question phrased wrong or have we just found out something that we need to cover in a tutoring session is so strong and if you think about exactly like um Jacqueline just said you know when you open the door to a school leader and you ask them to come in and scrutinize your work, it sounds like I know Anita, right? Anita, right? And and but whether you're on on, on whichever side of, of that dynamic you are. So me as a school leader, I I tried to go into classrooms so often that I didn't scare people when I went into classrooms. Yeah. And I think that's the concept of supervision also. It's that thing of if you leave. If you leave the door open, it doesn't scare you when the door gets opened. And 
I, I always have this, you know, this image in my mind and it's not a very pleasant image, but it, you'll understand what I mean. You know, when you lift a rock and you see all the bugs scurry because of the light. Yeah. <laughs> but if you if you left the rock up, then the bugs would get acclimatized to, I mean, maybe they wouldn't, they'd go and find another shadowy place to be, but you know, once you lift, once you, once you create a light space, then you're in a much, much stronger position to be able to be reflective without being fearful because that vulnerability doesn't come as a shock. It's your natural way of being. Does that resonate? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think I had I had similar experiences in one of the last schools I worked in where there was I think that the head teacher was trying to create the same environment. It was a case of, you know, I just want to come in from a position of trying to support you. Um, but you just get different experiences in different establishments, don't you? So and I think if you've been used to, like you said, Jacqueline, the environment of as soon as I share that vulnerability. I kind of get questioned um, and it makes me question and doubt myself. Um, that's that's really, it's not, it just isn't helpful. It just isn't helpful at any stage of your career. It just isn't helpful. So, yeah, I think it's, it's. I suppose it's about people creating that, having those conversations openly and frequently enough to be able to build that trust in their staff. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think it's also like, we stop listening to our own intuition. Yeah. Because the, the voice that's loudest is that is a critical one that usually belongs to somebody else. <laughs> but they're in your head now. And as you say, it's that, like, what will people think of me mm-hmm. if I say, I don't really understand this in a staff meeting, or you question it, or you think, oh, that didn't go so well. I want to go and revisit that. It's this kind of like churning forward all the time, always making forward motion, when in actual fact, what's wrong with circling back <laughs> and thinking hmm. that just to stay curious to it like oh why didn't that work as well or when asked it you know even just saying to the children you know I didn't feel that worked as as well as I thought it would what, what are your thoughts like they have always have brilliant ideas they are incredibly wise and, and there might be something that you're doing that is actually really counterintuitive but until somebody has the, they have the ability to let you know, you'll not grow either as a, as an educator. So I, I think it is just that kind of always circling back and thinking like, and being reflective is super important. Um, and another element of supervision circles is um, like, if you came with a challenge as well, it's like that kind of hive mind focus. Mm-hmm. So you would have an opportunity to like mastermind uh, a challenge or a problem. And the way that would look is you've got one minute to explain the challenge to the group. The rest of us have three minutes to ask clarifying questions just so we truly understand what the challenge or opportunity is. And then you get to be completely quiet and take notes and the rest of the group discuss the problem as if you were not in the room coming up with all the different solutions. And then you can take whatever learning you want from that because it's sometimes you're you're so close to the problem, you don't see a solution. Does that that make sense? So that's another way to, in the supervision circles that we actually all use. So it's that collective knowledge, but in a very supportive way. It's not, well, well, if it were my, you know, pupil, I would be doing this with them. It's not that, it's like, I wonder if she's thought of this yet. I wonder if she's tried that. And it's just hearing all these, you'll know yourself what's right for you. But it's hearing all those opportunities. You think, yes, that, that would work really well for maybe this child and maybe a different approach for that child. So they're also really, really powerful. But the the, the core of supervision is it's active. In, it's that self-directed process. And, and you really do get out of it what you put in. So the more open you are to being vulnerable, the the more growth you're going to get in a shorter space of time because it's actually allowing yourself just accepting the your uh, limitations and your strengths and actually trusting your instinct more that you do actually know what's what's right for you and for the children that you work with i um, that sound? 
I, I love the innocence of all of that. There's like a, there's like an openness and a curiosity and where you say like, as if you weren't in the room, because I have this bad habit, which is not a bad habit, but it looks like a bad habit of asking advice and then doing what I want anyway, <laughs> because I trust my own instincts. I trust my own intuition, but I want the advice because it will inform my decision. So when you it tends to be, when you ask people for advice, it feels like you're beholden to do what they suggest. And that's very specifically not what you're talking about here. No, it's purely, think of it like, um, I think it'd be like we got into like our kind of queen energy. You know, like the, you are in charge of your realm. And as the queen, you would ask your advisors for advice. That doesn't mean you're going to do what they've said. It's, it's advice only. But you still are in charge. Like the queen wouldn't sort of say, or the queen wouldn't be arrogant enough to think that she knows everything. But um, she would certainly take on advice and she would want to know the full picture. And what the supervision circles do is they let you have that 360 perspective because everyone will see it in a slightly different way and everyone's opinion is valid. It doesn't mean that it is what you must do. But it's always, I think it's good to hear other people's ideas. And from that, you'll know in yourself mm, that sits right with me or that just mm, that doesn't feel quite where I'm energetically wanting to be right now. So I'm not going to. But it's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. And there's, and there's also a ton of professional development in being an advisor. Exactly. And I think also what I've noticed whenever I do um, these kind of like we call them like a hot seat mastermind. What? Well, even though you go with your challenge, when you're actually hearing other people's challenges and you're kind of brainstorming ideas for them, you actually quite often answer some of your own challenges <laughs> that you didn't even know you had. So it's like everyone learns and grows, even if you're not the hot seat person that, you know, it's not your, your challenge or opportunity. And sometimes it's like having, when I'm saying an opportunity, it's sometimes the permission to be brave is what you're seeking as well. It's like, is, is everyone, do you think this is a good idea? And it's like, you know, just getting that energy behind you, like, yes, this is the right thing for you to do next. Um, and then once we've had, once you've heard all the, the advice, it's like, you can have that minute to reflect on what you heard and um, do with it what, what you will. Um, but it's just that increased self-awareness that is, really really vital and um and just being with like-minded individuals and having that kind of hive hive mind approach to to get being better being the best version of you can I ask a question then about how how so like I do like at the end of like different sections of what I give the kids I'll have this opportunity for them to reflect on what they did well what do they need to work on and what you're saying has really made me question whether I should ask them the same questions of what I'm doing with them. Ooh. That's quite scary when it's you... It's scary. It's scary because, you know, their parents are paying me to kind of know this stuff. And you're kind of then saying, oh, maybe it's not quite right for you. So that feels a bit weird. So it's not that you're saying, oh, my goodness, my my whole lesson was... But what you're actually saying is, I have created this learning opportunity for us to work through together. And I think it'll work, but you, it is, what do I mean? The, you're not doing learning to them. They are part of it. So even to say like, you know, did, did anything like surprise you um, mm. today? What, what would you, what was the the one thing you're going to take forward after today's session? What's the one thing you're going to do differently? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, like, what's, what's one thing I could do again that you really enjoyed? Is there anything I could do to make it easier for you? Yeah. So you're not, you're not saying them, you know, you're not wanting them to kind of critically analyze you, but what you are giving them is the opportunity to, give you their suggestions mm. and ideas of what you know even things like what is there anything that helps the most yeah is there anything we've done that has been less helpful um 
So I'm thinking this because I've been doing the, I always forget the name of it, sorry, Julia, Foundations in Tutoring, is it just that? Yeah, yeah, Foundations in right. Effective Tutoring, yeah. Effective Tutoring. I knew there was something else in there. Yeah, I've got quite close to the end of that now. And there's that um, document with the um, what adds value. It's and the, the um, EEF PG Learning Toolkit. Thinking about thinking is the thing that adds the most to learning. So that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? Asking the students what they think they need. Is that, am I picking that up right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what you're, when, when we thought about there about, when we did that together in our reflective practice, like that forward pacing, like what elements would you take forward to use in your life outside of this, this session? And it's, it's that for them to think like, oh, right, so what really helped me, even if they can think of like, what's one thing that you're going to do differently because of today? So it's not lots of things, it's one thing. And then for them to kind of even commit that, like through um, speaking it, if they want to write it down, if you want to write it down, you know, on their behalf and say, right, I'm going to check in with you, that little bit of accountability, I'm going to check in with you next time and see how that went for you. When do you think this is, you'd be able to use that? this week coming so you're getting them to already put in their kind of their reticular activating system their brain and their filter focus machine to think oh this is a this is a chance coming up um in school and i know that this particular way of learning really suits me i'm going to try that in that situation and see if i get a different outcome you know if we keep doing the same thing we're just going to get the same thing so they're here for tutoring because something they're finding challenge in a particular area and what you're hoping them to be you want them to be reflective learners you're not going to be with them forever and if you're doing your job well they won't be with you forever <laughs> you know that's the whole point um it's not like a kind of um yeah it's they, they need you for as long as they they need the support but then you want them to actually be able to action this themselves in the future they need to understand themselves as learners first. I think Claire's found something really, really important here in terms of um, associating reflective practice with metacognition and self-regulation. Um, and that, as we know, that is one of the key skills that our students are going to need in life. And so it all starts with us. And by engaging in our own reflective practice to boost out self-regulation and metacognition, we will be able to spill that over into our students. So it's immense what we're talking about here, but Anita's question reminded me of something. Very early on in my tutoring, I used to make the mistake of asking parents for feedback. I used to um, bring them in to the end of every session and share with them what they what I'd done with the child, expecting them to have a clue, <laughs> like expecting them to have an opinion on the activity and understand what the learning was and, and actually partner with me in that. And it took me a while to realize they didn't want that, they didn't need that, and they couldn't help me with that. But really what I was looking for was supervision. Really what I was looking for was somebody to say, that was awesome, or have you tried this instead? And they were not that person. So that conflict that you felt there, Anita, where on the one hand, you wanted to ask the students to um, participate and reflect at that level, but on the other hand, not make yourself vulnerable as, as a professional, mm -hmm. is, is exactly what this concept is, why I'm so proud of what we're creating here. It's, it's what supervision circles should come to bring us. It's that sense of, keeping us honest, yeah, and keeping us always growing without being too vulnerable in front of our clients, which is just not helpful. That's it, it's getting the balance right, isn't it? Mm. And not coming across, yeah, you just don't want to, to give them the wrong impression that they need to question your professionalism, your abilities, your, your expertise in this, you know, you're just trying to understand how to tweak something to make it better for their child then it's not about I can't do my job I just need to know how to do it better that's all um yeah yeah 
How and did those questions feel? Uh, would you feel comfortable asking any of those at the end of a session, even if it was just one one question? What one do you feel that you could? I've just written loads down. I've written loads down. I just think it would make me. I think it is about breaking down that barrier as well. It's like when Claire was saying about making mistakes. Mistakes are really good because they make you seem more human and more approachable and more normal. You're not like at some different level to them all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're you know, you, you do get things wrong every now and again. And that's how these questions feel. It doesn't feel so, yeah, like you kind of- Judgment out, isn't it? No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Because yeah. even if you think about, um, in like Precision Wisdom Coaching, we, we have um, marvelous mistakes is what we call them. And, and the way, that I would explain that is when you make a marvellous mistake, it's when you're just on the outskirts of your comfort zone. So you're not very well practised at something. So it's highly likely that you will make a mistake. And just as like Claire, you're saying like, you're making all these lovely resources and you know, you just forget to click a, a box. Well, yeah, you're doing lots of, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And I think sometimes we think mistakes equal it's bad or it's not you know it's it's terrible and we should hide and it's not so you know I yeah um yeah I actually encourage looking for marvelous mistakes because if we're making marvelous mistakes it means we're learning if we were getting everything right it means we're just practicing something we already kind of knew how to do we're not really challenging ourselves when you're making a marvelous mistake that is where you're learning you're on the 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 cusp of your knowledge so you're you're putting you into yourself into your stretch zone and it's only when we're stretching will we learn. If we're just staying in comfort, we're, we're not really learning. If, if they're not making mistakes, something is wrong. It's, it's really brought to bear. I've been creating all these resources for over a year now. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to get it finished in the sense of there'll be something for everything by December and then it'll all need tweaking and repairing probably but I just keep chugging through it and through it and doing it and it's never occurred to me to ask the kids what do you think um yeah I do get oh I love it when I have to do a quiz they'll volunteer things um and there's times when I sit and work through problems with them it's not just all automated get on with it yourself but it's really making me think at the end of a session, I should just say, what have you enjoyed today? And what haven't you enjoyed? And just see what comes out of that. And then it- Or even if you phrase it like, what's been the most helpful? Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that felt like a challenge or less helpful? So even like what they've been, it's not necessarily they're always, they have to enjoy mm -hmm. it. And that can be, um, what do I mean? If you say it that way, it feels like there should be like immense fun factor the whole time. And that, that's not what learning is. So even if you say like, what's been the most helpful with this or what has been. Well, that was my battery dying on my computer. 
<laughs> Marvelous mistake. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry for the disruption. Uh, <laughs> but um, it actually gives us five minutes to wrap up this conversation, which with your permission, I'll do now. Um, firstly, I want to share with you that this has felt like such an uplifting conversation. Um, and and thank you for that, Jacqueline, because that, that trustful experience is the best thing that you can bring us, that positive boost. Um, but I, I would love to pull on that thread of judgmentalism. Yeah, so we know that what's lovely about these conversations is, is how non-judgmental they are, although this one is live streamed, to, so we are being careful with our vulnerability, but there's still a tone of, of openness and curiosity here. And if you think about that moment that you described when you went to a school leader, in theory, you went to your school leader and you said, I'm not sure if that fractions lesson well went well enough. And you would assume that they would go straight to scrutinizing and capability, right? Rather than growth mindset and supporting you to be your best self. Unfortunately, we live in a time when um, we, we, we fall into judgmentalism and, and um, fixed mindsets so quickly. And we struggle to keep our minds open to growth and vulnerability and, and marvelous mistakes. Um, and it happens as well when we're working with our clients. So on the one scenario, the school leader is the person that we're accountable to. As a tutor, the parent is the person that we're accountable to. And again, we see that we tend, we, we fall into judgment because of coming from this place of, you know, fear and worry and accountability, but really what's joyful in this whole conversation has been dropping all of that, being open to batteries dying and ruining Zoom conversations, um, but also being open to having fantastic, fresh ideas. And, and, and you know, I, it's very clearly landed in my mind that, at the end of a group session, you can say to the students, what worked really well for you in that session? And what didn't work really well for you in that session? Because I want to keep making it better for you. And, and that's an element of co-creation. And it's an element of inviting students to reflect on their own thinking and learning that is the height of professional development. And it's just come from this really healthy, genuine conversation. So. If you would like to participate in supervision circles, Jacqueline will be with, here with us for the next three Thursdays, which is my favorite thing. And then we will be doing a full 90 minute taster session of supervision circles on Love Tutoring Autumn Festival, which I've just created. And it's the 23rd of November online, totally free to join. And we will have a full 90 minute session with Jacqueline and Lorna on supervision circles. So you'll have a proper taster. And then the program is launching on the 24th. It will be running every fortnight on a Friday morning from 9 to 11.30. It is not expensive at all. Um, we have made sure that it's not expensive because we want you to join it. Um, and so what I'll do is in the link afterwards, I in the in the in the in the community and in the LinkedIn, I will drop the link for supervision circles and you can find out about those costs there. But of all the things I've created in Qualified Tutor over the years, I think that this is one really, really that will create a seed change for tutors. Because of exactly what we said before, we need to stay honest, we need to stay open, and yet we are vulnerable to accountability and judgment from the outside world. And so creating those safe spaces for us could have kept us in school, but since we're not in school, let it help us to keep us tutoring and love tutoring. Thank you for your time and your participation. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jacqueline. Have a great day.